Uh, we warmly welcome you all to the session on small feeds. This is a session mainly aimed at giving the new advances in six subspecialties in medicine. And due to limited time available for the six sessions, we will not be entertaining any questions. And to start off the first session on cardiology, I warmly invite Dr. Garmini Galapathy, consultant cardiologist at the Institute of Cardiology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And I must uh, thank the Ceylon College of Physicians and the committee for inviting me. Uh, I must also congratulate Dr. Anand Vijayavikrama, my good friend and batchmate, uh, and the council for organizing this wonderful session laid over three days uh, in, during these uh, difficult times, utilizing the most advanced technology. Um, the session on small feeds, it's the first time I'm doing something like this, giving a small feed. Uh, I think it's inherent in the name that the feed uh, should be small, should be quick, should be also nutrition and digestible. And I will take up the challenge and try to talk to you on two guidelines with wide uh, varying, uh, wide ranging implications as well as wide ranging applications in my uh, specialty uh, as asked by the College of Physicians uh, from me. So uh, the first update that I have chosen is a 2019 ESC guidelines for management of lipids. Now this guideline gives a new concept of total CVD risk estimation. And this is really useful as well as practical, I believe, uh, as well as this is used across all their platforms uh, of guidelines like hypertension and heart failure uh, and primary prevention. So total cardiovascular disease risk estimation is a concept that has been introduced here. Um, the treatment goals for LDL is based on the cardiovascular disease risk estimation. And the intervention strategies to achieve the LDL goal is based on the former. So, Let's quickly look at these. Total cardiovascular disease risk categories are very high, high, moderate, and low. And the treatment goals to achieve the desired LDL target is based on an individual's cardiovascular disease risk status. So these slides, actually, I'm going to present only two slides from these uh, guidelines. This, uh, these are very uh, extensive and very self-explanatory. You can see the uh, risk categories, very high, high, moderate, and low, and various uh, people who fall into those categories. And on the uh, y-axis, you get the desired LDL levels, uh, as well as a more than 50% reduction from the baseline. So for the very high categories, you get 55 milligrams uh, LDL, uh, high 70, moderate 100 and low 160. So who are the very high risk? Anybody with uh, established at atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, belongs to this category as well as diabetics, uh, cert certain uh, category of diabetics with more than 20 years uh, duration or target organ damage, as well as severe CKD and family history with, uh, and, and uh, familial hyperlipidemias with uh, atherosclerotic disease. So it's easy to remember any of your ischemic heart disease patients will fall into this very high risk category and they need a target uh, LDL of 55. So atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned, it encompasses all these people, unstable anginas, MIs, PCI, CABG, TIS, CVA, peripheral dis uh, vascular disease, and anybody proved with imaging criteria given in the guideline. CKD and heterozygous familial hyperlipidemias, uh, the other uh, exotic cholesterol categories, diabetes, depending on the type, duration, and target organ damage, will fall into those categories. And for anybody without any of these, they describe a thing called the score chart. 
And this is for European populations, and we have our other categories in Sri Lanka, especially the uh, WHO CAD category, Southeast Asian for Sri Lanka. But it will, you cannot sort of incorporate both of these together uh, scientifically, but uh, practically you can probably. So total here, this for the score chart, it gives the 10-year fatal cardiovascular disease risk uh, for an individual, depending on the total cholesterol, not the ADL, the blood pressure, the smoking status, gender, risk region in Europe, and probably the HDL as well, which were not incorporated in the previous categorization. So uh, ag again, the, the various risk categories, the total cardiovascular disease risk categories, very high, high, moderate, and low, and the target ADL levels. No, So now uh, the third thing is, how do you achieve this target ADL level? The type of intervention strategy to achieve the target LDL is based again on the total cardiovascular disease risk and the patient's baseline LDL level. Now, it might come as a surprise to some of you, but they uh, advise doing the non-fasting lipid analysis for baseline LDL level. As, as we all practically know, fasting for 14 hours or 12 hours or even 10 hours is a rather cumbersome thing. Uh, and here you can do a non-fasting lipid analysis for total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, non-HDL, FOB, and live protein, uh, simple A. And this non-fasting lipid analysis is not recommended for uh, triglycerides, but it is valid for the guidelines. So the types of intervention strategies that are available are three, lifestyle advice only, lifestyle intervention plus or minus drugs, and lifestyle intervention with mandatory drugs. So here is the second slide from these guidelines. I think these two slides themselves really tell the entire picture, or rather the entire story. And here uh, you have that, uh, depending on the LDL level uh, and the risk category, the red ones are where you need to start uh, lifestyle plus drugs in the first go. Here's a patient that we came across, a 34-year-old Sri Lankan female with an acute anti -rheumai. Mind you, she's 34 years, and she was admitted to my unit for primary PCI, where we did a primary PCI to the LAD, which was 100% acute thrombotically occluded. She had severe two vessel disease. We put three stents to her. And on examination in the ICU the following day, I noticed these uh, lumps on her knees, which were tendon xanthomata. On inquiring, we found that some of them had been surgically removed, and you can, in fact, appreciate the scar there as well. But she, the opportunity had been lost at that point to monitor her and follow up. So uh, this is a patient with familial hyperlipidemia, and going by the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network criteria, uh, where they give a very high score for the tendon xanthomata, and premature coronary artery disease, as well as very high LDL level. Her LDL is 283. She gets about 13 points, and this is a definite uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, in this patient, what is her total CVD risk, treatment goals, and what inter interventions? Obviously, uh, you might uh, uh, realize that in her, her, that her total CVD risk is very high, given that she's already uh, uh, having uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and her LDL goal is 55. Okay, so from there, the intervention uh, to achieve, she will basically, uh, these are the slides, uh, again, according to the guidelines, she will fall into that category where you need to start uh, immediate drugs as well. So what drugs do we have uh, in our armamentarium? We have uh, moderate and high intensity statins, ezetimide, PCSK9 inhibitors, and some other drugs. So uh, the expected lipid lowering with these uh, medications is basically, uh, if you are advised to achieve more than 50%, you have to basically 50% uh, reduction from the baseline, high intensity statins, 50% plus, uh, the target LDL, which is 55 in her case, we have started on statins plus acetamide, statins at 80, uh, and we are 
following her up as well as family screening. So the second uh, guideline that I uh, want to talk to you very briefly is the 2019 ESC guidelines on diabetes, pre-diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Here, uh, we talk of four categories of drugs that are known to reduce cardiovascular disease mortality uh, as treatment of diabetes, the metformin, the SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, uh, glyco, uh, sorry, uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonists like liraglutide and the thiazolidone dione's pyoglitazone. Now, the empagliflozin and dapagliflozin are much talked about these days, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and empagliflozin reduce cardiac deaths in diabetes with cardiovascular disease, and both of these drugs have reduced cardiovascular events in diabetic with cardiovascular disease. Those are the trials. So SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetes with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or very high to high total cardiovascular disease risk, our guidelines recommend uh, these to be started as first line monotherapy, right? And if the patient is already on metformin to be added on to that. So this is the guidelines there. First line monotherapy is now SGLT2 inhibitor if the patient is having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with diabetes or deemed high or very high risk. The next interesting thing, as Niamali mentioned, is the uh, emperor reduced heart failure trials, uh, sorry, the, the uh, emperor reduced heart failure trials and the DEPA heart failure trials published recently. These encompass that, these actually tell us that diabetics or non-diabetics, these two drugs, uh, improve the outcome in heart failure. So SGLT2 inhibitors are a new standard of care in heart failure and may be included in this quadruple therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction along with ARNI uh, and the trial evidence is there, beta blockers and uh, mineral corticoid receptor inhibitors. Your time is up, sir. Yeah, this is my last uh, uh, slide. Availability in Sri Lanka. And uh, as we know, the, the last two are available, the SGLT2 receptor inhibitors are available, GLP ones are available, but the ARNIs are still not. And PCSK9 is also not available, and probably we should aim to get them available to our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gavani Galapati, for your informative lecture. May I invite my co chairperson, Dr. Zushara, to hand over the, the token of appreciation on behalf of the CCP Council and the President. The next speaker for the small feeds today is Dr. Suharshi Silva, consultant, respiratory physician. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the College of Ceylon College of Physicians for the invite, invitation given to me uh, to speak in this uh, distinguished forum. It's uh, heartening to see uh, some of my most respected teachers as well as my friends in the audience. Um, the, so this is some small feeds in pulmonology. Uh, I thought of... Um, talking about uh, two guidelines. Uh, one is GINA uh, regarding asthma management uh, and the other guideline which has been formulated by the college as well uh, with collaboration of, uh, with collaboration of um, uh, Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists for OSA. So uh, let's see the recent changes in asthma management. Uh, the most striking change in the most recent GINA guideline uh, with regards to asthma is GINA no longer recommends treatment with short-acting beta agonists uh, alone for intermittent and mild asthma. That is, we don't prescribe salbutamol or any other short-acting beta agonist for mild and intermittent asthma anymore. It is not recommended. Why? Because the studies have shown that uh, SABA only treatment does not protect patients from severe exacerbations and uh, regular and frequent use of SABA 
increases the risk of exacerbations. Whether they have intermittent or mild asthma, they still have the risk of getting severe attacks with that resulting in death. So when the patients are um, used to take uh, treatment with uh, Saba, uh, concealing their symptoms, not um, attending to the basic uh, pathophysiology of asthma, uh, they can, uh, the, uh, the prevention, the golden time to prevent severe exacerbation might lost, might get lost on them. So uh, Gina is not recommending Saba alone uh, for any sort of asthma, especially mild and intermittent asthma. And this is uh, the 30 years, in the 30 years of GINA history, this is coming as a groundbreak um, uh, change. So what are they recommending? All adults and adolescents with asthma should receive either symptom driven or as we say, as needed uh, base or daily low dose of ICS containing controller treatment to reduce the risk of serious exacerbations in mild and intermittent asthma. So what are the ICS options that available that are recommended? Uh, we can use as needed low dose uh, ICS and formaterol combination. Uh, if it is not available, we can, uh, we can use low dose ICS taken whenever SABA is taken. Like if you, if the patient, if we, if you advise a patient to take as SABA, the patient need to take low dose ICS along with it. For my, this is for mild, mild and intermittent asthma. Uh, or the patient can take regular, the patient's regular ICS or ICS LABA combination every day plus as needed SABA. So the patient is, or if the patient is already on uh, regular ICS, that can be, that should be continued as needed. That's the 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 current um, uh, no, the current uh, commonly commonly used um, regime and maintenance and reliever treatment with ICS formaterol ICS formaterol combination with reliever being low dose butyrosinate formaterol or BDP formaterol. That is, um, uh, uh, yeah. So this will. Uh, uh, further, this is the slide of most recent uh, recent GINA um, uh, 2020. So you can see um, the step one, as needed low dose ICS formaterol uh, for the controller or uh, low dose ICS taken whenever SABA is taken. So the, the groundbreaking, um, uh, the change is, now that we can advise patient to take inhaled corticosteroids um, as, as needed basis. So, uh, and uh, this, uh, the, the data only available at the pre at present for the ICS is on butyrosinide only. So butyrosinide formaterol is the preferred combination. We can prescribe patients to take it as needed basis, not salbutamol as needed or any other short acting SAB as needed, but ICS formaterol combination can be used on as needed basis for intermittent and mild asthma. This is uh, since 2019 um, GINA uh, guidelines. And uh, coming back to the current uh, normal, uh, new normal situation that we are facing with, that is COVID-19 and asthma. So I thought of uh, it's uh, timely that I speak a few words about uh, COVID-19 plus asthma. So this current uh, GINA guidelines, uh, they have a different, um, different, um, specially uh, designated uh, section on advising patients with asthma and the physicians who are treating patients with asthma uh, during this current new normal situation that is we are that we are facing with. Uh, it is advised uh, the patients are advised to take their prescribed asthma medications, particularly ICS and oral corticosteroids if prescribed without without fail, because this can this will um, this this should be stressed to the patients. It's very important that they take their regular inhalers, corticosteroid inhalers, as this can um, this can. Uh, 
uh, otherwise the patient can get severe asthma attacks. And it's very important to have a written asthma action plan. I think this is very relevant to our context as well, where the patients are facing um, uh, travel restrictions, or they are, fa they are um, reluctant to come to the hospital, uh, the fear of uh, contacting COVID and the social stigma associated with contacting COVID. So uh, the pa it's very important that the patients have an action plan advising them how to increase their controller and relieve medications when they have asthma, worse asthma, worsening of asthma symptoms and uh, how to take a short course of oral corticosteroids while at home if they are facing exacerbations and when to take, actually when to take medical help if their symptoms are getting worse. I think this is very important in current context where the patients are uh, being held at home or they are, when they are um, traveling is restricted. And nebulizing is avoided, advised to avoid nebulizing where possible because, uh, because of um, the risk of uh, co uh, infection, risk of infection to the patient, other patients as well as healthcare workers. Nebulizing is not advised. So you can ask that we can uh, use um, meter dose inhalers with uh, spacer with a mouthpiece or tight fitting mask instead of nebulizing. This is currently practiced in respiratory wards and this is the, the recommended guideline uh, at present. And spirometry and peak flow metry is avoided as much as possible, in, especially in patients with confirmed COVID or suspected COVID-19 patients. If, if it is really necessary to have spirometry, uh, the, the local guide and guidelines are followed. The patients are, in, uh, it is absolutely contraindicated during COVID, or if you, if you are really pressed for a lung function test or spirometry, you have to exclude COVID and follow the local, um, local guidelines, strict infection control procedures. And um, we talk about, um, risk, uh, high risk categories to have severe COVID-19 infection. So is asthma a high risk condition to have severe COVID-19? Uh, this is uh, because we have a lot of asthma patients in our community, but luckily so far the studies uh, which, have, which, have, which have been done in China, uh, UK and USA in the initial period of this, this epidemic has not shown that asthma is an independent risk factor to have um, severe COVID infection. But the recent studies, recent studies uh, are suggesting that the patients who have uh, non-allergic asthma, that is uh, exercise-induced asthma, asthma associated with um, air pollution, uh, asthma, um, asthma with um, uh, yeah, air, basically non-allergic asthma patients might have a high risk for uh, developing severe COVID-19 but not our day-to-day, -day, the, the patients that we usually see who are having allergic asthma. They are not uh, categorized as a high risk category to get this condition. Something a little, bit, little something about OSA, because the, my second topic, I'll be quick. Uh, we, are, we are formulating guideline along with College of Physicians and um, the College of Pulmonologists uh, on OSA. So OSA, as we know, it's the day, excessive daytime sleepiness and loud snoring and witness happening events. Uh, so it, I think it's important that we stressed upon who should be screened for OSA. There are several uh, screening, um, screening models to screen patients like stop band questionnaire and uh, if with, uh, sleepiness scale. Exactly who should be screened for OSA? So this is a this is um, these all these categories which I have um, mentioned here have uh, very good evidence that OSA con presence of OSA is adversely affecting these the conditions which I am which I have highlighted here that is obesity hyperventilation syndrome a heart failure especially congestive heart failure the patients who are having and hypertension, especially young and resistant hypertension patients, patients with ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, uh, mainly atrial fibrillation, and poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, pulmonary artery hypertension, stroke, even the first stroke, um, and secondary polycythemia, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypothyroidism, Down syndrome, interestingly, it is no, very well known that Down syndrome patients have 50 to 100% risk of having 
um, OSA. And it, it is adversely um, affecting their cognitive, cognition, their behavior, because we know a good sleep is uh, very much uh, needed, for, especially when during, the, during their developing age. So uh, it is recommended that these patients should be at least screened for the presence of OSA. So that's all for my small feed. I again, thank you for your, um, thank you for your listening. Thank you. On behalf of the council, I would like to invite Chintana to present the token of appreciation to Dr. Suharshi Silva for the small feeds on respiratory. And up next, we have the small feeds in gastroenterology by Professor Madhunil Niriyala. He's a professor in gastroenterology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I'll be presenting two topics related to my uh, subspecialty, gastroenterology, uh, in this small feed symposium. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to declare. First of all, I'd like to talk about uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and the liver. And I'd like to highlight three aspects here liver enzyme elevation in COVID 19 among patients with no pre existing chronic liver disease, and then look at COVID 19 in patients with chronic liver disease, and the impact of COVID-19 on liver transplantation. The mechanism of liver injury in COVID-19 illness is multifactorial. There is direct cytopathic effects of the virus. Uncontrolled immune reaction or the cytokine storm can affect the liver. Secondary sepsis can lead to bystander hepatitis. And we very well know that drug-induced liver injury was common with the, some of the drugs that were used to treat this illness in the initial phase of the pandemic. Liver enzyme elevation is common in this illness, ranging from 14 to 53 percent, but more met recent meta-analysis studies have shown that the percentage is actually towards the low end. Liver enzyme elevation is only mild, only up to about two times upper limit of normal in most patients. It's mostly hepatocellular, AST more than ALT, and the liver derangement is mostly common in severe COVID-19, and raised ALT more than five times upper limit of normal on admission predicted severe COVID-19 with higher rates of ICU admission, intubation, need for renal replacement therapy, and mortality. What about COVID-19 in patients with chronic liver disease? We know that underlying chronic liver disease is associated with worse outcomes. Studies done in UK have shown that adjusted hazard ratio of 1.75 for in-hospital death among patients with chronic liver disease and COVID-19 compared to controls. Similar results from US, a relative risk of death of three with patients with COVID-19 and chronic liver disease compared to control. NAFL patients may be at higher risk of severe COVID-19, but it's hard to separate from the associated metabolic uh, associations like diabetes and hypertension. There is no evidence that COVID-19 affects more severely in chronic viral hepatitis, and there is no evidence of worsening cholestasis in patients with pre-existing biliary disease. We have two international registries, the Secure Cirrhosis and the COVID-HEP registry, one in the U based in US, the other one in Europe, giving us uh, a lot of data as to what's happening with these patients with chronic liver disease and COVID-19. In patients with non-cirrhotic chronic liver disease, the death rate is around 7%. That's more than twice the, that of the normal population. In cirrhotic, it can be as high as 32%. One third can die. And uh, they present with any form of decompensation in about 50% of patients. And post liver transplant patients also have a high mortality, around 20%. But we have to be cautious because these data are from the first wave of the pandemic. And these are patient or phys sorry, physician reported uh, data. This may be an overestimation. So patients with cirrhosis are at much higher risk of severe disease with COVID-19 and risk of death. Respiratory failure was still the most common cause of death, but liver-related complications came next. Some patients had no respiratory symptoms at presentation. They only presented with decompensation. So it's important to test any cirrhotic patient presenting with decompensation, even without respiratory symptoms, in high prevalent areas. What about transplantation? Transplant activity is reduced for all organs, including the liver, throughout the world because of this pandemic, and we are also affected. 
and outcomes in post-transplant patients, these patients present with COVID-19 with mostly GI symptoms, they need hospital admission, acute kidney injury is common among them, ALT elevation was surprisingly not so common, immunosuppression may have to be reduced in these patients during active infection, thereby increasing risk of graft rejection during these episodes, and we had to be careful. What about immunosuppression? No clear association of worse disease either with SARS, MERS, or with COVID-19 among immunosuppressed. Therefore, preventive measures as for all is very important, physical distancing, wearing masks, and aggressive hand sanitization. Should be advised to all patients on immunosuppression, including liver transplant patients. Do not reduce or avoid the required immunosuppression preemptively. There is no need prior to infection. In, however, in patients with COVID-19, after transplant, those who are on immunosuppression, we may need to consider reducing but not stopping the immunosuppression totally, but there is no strong data to support this approach. The second topic that I want to discuss is the redefinition or redefining non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. We know that uh, fatty liver is more prevalent among people or populations with metabolic dysfunction. Morbid obese patients presenting for bariatric surgery have 90% nephal prevalence. Obesity and diabetes, 70%. Metabolic syndrome and dyslipidemic patients, 50%. The other way around is also true. Those who have nephal have future risk of diabetes, two to five percent, two to five times. Not only that, they have increased cardiovascular, kidney disease, and cancer risks, both, both up to about two times. We know metabolic syndrome increases the risk of mortality in nephal. From our own studies, we know that in those with nephal, metabolic syndrome independently predicted uh, was associated with 10-year all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And we know higher the number of components of the metabolic syndrome, higher the mortality in nephal. So fatty liver associated metabolic dis dysfunction is common. However, the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease does not reflect this current knowledge of strong association of metabolic dysfunction and metabolic diseases with fatty liver. It only highlights the need for exclusion of secondary fatty liver, mainly alcohol excess. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Therefore, metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease or incorporating the metabolic dysfunction associated with fatty liver is a more inclusive and probably more appropriate overreaching term or definition for this disease. This is the new definition. Any adult with hepatic steatosis detected by imaging technique, blood biomarkers, or histology, either they are overweight or obese, or they have diabetes, they qualify to be uh, defined as MAFL. Only those with normal or lean habitus, or they don't have diabetes, they need at least two more metabolic risk factors, which are minor risk factors, and these include uh, raised waist circumference, high blood pressure, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, pre-diabetes, high HOMA IR scores, and high CRP. We applied this new criteria versus the old NEFL criteria in one of our prospective community cohort follow-up studies, the Ragam Hill studies. The population comprised about 3,000 patients. As you can see from this diagram, the both definitions overlapped significantly. In our study, the diagnostic criteria MEFL detected only slightly higher number of people than NEFL. The delta was only 1.6. The proportion of anthropometric and metabolic abnormalities in both these groups at baseline, MEFL and NEFL, were very similar. And the outcomes after seven years was also very similar. The only difference was that those who were excluded by NEFL but included by MEFL definition had worse outcomes. Therefore, redefining NEFL as MEFL is does not seem to be very useful, but it is somewhat useful. So there is ongoing debate, and probably the MEFL definition probably will not uh, come into uh, prime time yet, and we will await more uh, further large studies from throughout the world. But I'm happy to say that we were one of the first to publish this. We don't have time for questions and comments, but you're free to uh, email me to my official email or Twitter handle. Thank you. Thanks, Madhunil, for that brilliant lecture and stick to your time. And may I invite my colleague Tushara to hand over the token of appreciation on behalf of the 
CCP Council and the President. And may I take the privilege of inviting the next speaker, Dr. Dulushi Vijayaratna, consultant nephrologist from NHSL. Thank the Ceylon College of Physicians for inviting me to present this small feed in nephrology. I'll be focusing on two topics that are very much in the news today. First, about COVID-19 associated acute kidney injury, and second, about SGLT2 inhibitors in nephrology. So this will be the outline of the first part of my presentation. Starting with the epidemiology, the reported incidence of AKI varies according to the background demographics of the study population, the study setting, and the definitions used. But overall, about 50% of the critically ill have AKI, and around 30% of ITU admissions will require renal replacement therapy. The presence of acute kidney injury will portend a poorer prognosis. What do we know about the pathogenesis of AKI in these patients? Well, we have the usual suspects. There's hypovolemia, that, which can be aggravated by fluid restrictive strategies used in ARDS. High peeps and volume trauma or barrel trauma in mechanical ventilation can have adverse renal effects. And we must never forget nephrotoxicity. There are some specific COVID-related uh, pathogenetic mechanisms. One is hypercoagulability, which we are well aware of. This can manifest as various cardiac uh, pathologies, which can lead to a cardiorenal syndrome and AKI. Much less frequently, we might see some renal infarction or thrombotic microangiopathy. Podocytopathy is a very interesting phenomenon that's been noted to be related with COVID. And there's some controversy about whether cytokine storm or direct renal tropism is an important uh, contributor to COVID-related AKI. So this is some uh, post-mortem data of 42 patients who died of COVID-19, 94% had developed AKI, and acute tubular injury was the main finding on biopsy, with a few other rarities noted. And this is similar to what we see in patients with sepsis. Collapsing glomerulopathy is a very interesting phenomenon seen in these patients. It's seen mainly in those who have high-risk ApoL1 alleles, such as those of African-American descent, rather similar to HIVAN, which we are much more familiar with. And this is important because these patients might go on to, to uh, progress to end-stage kidney disease. And these are a couple of curiosities, thrombotic microangiopathy involving the kidney and renal infarction involving the renal allograft and the native kidney. Not common, but definitely worth keeping in mind. There are no uh, COVID-specific prevention strategies as yet, but lung protective ventilation strategies, a careful fluid balance, and minimization of nephrotoxins would help. Just a few special management issues with regard to renal replacement therapy. These patients are often nursed in the prone position, so there can be difficulties in vascular access, and there's risk of catheter displacement and kinking. The hypercoagulable state extends to the extracorporeal circuit as well, so there can be reduced filter half-life. Using higher blood flow rates, higher anticoagulation targets, and CVVHD or HDF might be useful in preventing this. We work in a resource-limited setting even at the best of times, and are, we are very limited in terms of trained staff, machines, dialysate, and maintaining the supply chain of consumables. So I see this as a big problem in handling the epidemic. We also deal with a very vulnerable group of patients, and preventing cross-infection within the dialysis unit is very important. So I think we're all overwhelmed at what awaits us, but preparation and prevention will be key if we are to succeed. So 2020 hasn't been all doom and gloom. There has been some good news, and this uh, it relates to SGLT2 inhibitors, which have been creating their own kind of wave in the world of not just cardiology, but nephrology as well. SGLT inhibitors have been in the headlines over the last few years because of the positive outcomes from the cardiovascular outcome trials. And these trials also demonstrated positive renal outcomes. The Credence trial, which came out two years ago, was a study uh, predominantly de defined to uh, address the effects of canagliflozin in preventing hard renal outcomes in patients with established diabetic nephropathy. And this trial was terminated early because of evidence of efficacy in the treatment arm. So what you see here is what happens to the EGFR in a patient started on an SGL2 inhibitor. You can see that over the first few weeks, there's a 
acute reduction in GFR, which stabilizes during chronic treatment, and then a recovery of GFR following uh, cessation of treatment. So this suggests a, a hemodynamic effect of the drug, rather similar to what we see with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which are notorious for their renoprotective effects. And the mechanism that has been suggested as the cause of this uh, reduction in GFR and renal protection is the restoration of tubular glomerular feedback. So this is interesting because this goes beyond the hypoglycemic effect and suggests that these drugs might be affecting patients with non-diabetic kidney disease as well. And this was the basis for the DAPA-CKD trial, which was published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. This trial recruited patients with both diabetic nephropathy and non-diabetic CKD with EGFRs down to 25 and significant proteinuria. The patients were randomized to either receive dapagliflozin or placebo. The primary outcome was predominantly a renal outcome, hard clinical endpoints of a sustained 50% reduction in EGFR, end-stage kidney disease, cardiovascular, or renal death. These are the patient characteristics. There were around 4,000 patients recruited to the study, 68% had diabetes, which compares to other major SGLT2 inhibitor trials, which recruited only diabetic patients. The mean EGFR was on the lower side at 43. And what is really nice about this study is that 97% of patients were on RAS blockade, which is the standard therapy at present. So this study was also terminated early, 2.4 years, because of marked efficacy in the treatment arm. The uh, event rate of the primary outcome was reduced by 39% in the dapagliflozin arm, and the number needed to treat was only 19, which is quite significant because the number needed to treat in RAS inhibitor trials is around 40. Now, these positive outcomes also extended to the renal-specific co composite outcome. Dapagliflozin was superior not just in diabetic patients, but also in non-diabetic patients, and not just in patients with GFRs over 45, but also in those with GFRs less than 45, in whom the hypoglycemic effect of these drugs is not that much. There weren't any concerning safety results uh, in the stapa ckd trial, and overall with SGLT2 inhibitors, the main side effect of concern is mycotic genital infections. So what do we know now? SGLT2 inhibitors have renoprotective effects over and above that achieved by RAS blockade in both albuminuric di diabetic kidney disease and non-diabetic albuminuric CKD. And these result in improvement in hard renal outcomes. They are relatively safe. Efficacy in non-albuminuric CKD remains to be tested in a dedicated trial, and this trial is currently recruiting patients. However, the available data from our cardiovascular outcome trials suggest that these drugs will be efficacious in this group as well. Now, these drugs are very expensive. If we look at the cost, this will cost a patient around 30,000 rupees a year in our country. And to, to prevent one outcome, this will cost us about 1.2 million rupees. If we look at the cost of hemodialysis, it's around close to 1 million rupees per patient per year. And this is not taken into account other added costs such as uh, transport, medications, loss of income, and intangible costs to life and body. So I think overall, uh, the effect and the efficacy of SGLT2 inhibitors is not in debate. And if any of us had an indication to be on these drugs, I think we all would want to be on them. But what about putting knowledge into practice? We've known for about 20 years now that RAS blockade is effective in preventing hard renal outcomes in patients with diabetic nephropathy. But this data is from the US and it's quite disappointing. And it shows that only about 60% of patients with CKD who deserve to be on some form of RAS blockade are actually receiving this treatment. And I think data from Sri Lanka is likely to be no better. So it's time for us to be more proactive about identifying patients who will benefit from this treatment and making these drugs available to these patients. And this is one of the conclusions of an editorial that was published in the CJSN last month, which says that all nephrologists should make discussing the SGLT2 inhibitor with their patients their main New Year's resolution for 2021. So I'd like to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dilushi, for finishing on time and for that excellent small feed. I invite Shintana to deliver the token of appreciation on behalf of the Council. Up next, for the small feeds on neurology, we have Dr. Kishara Gunaratna, consultant neurologist at District General Hospital, Hambantota.
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank CCP for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on uh, two areas that I'd like to focus on uh, that uh, commonly, uh, that are common in neurology, that's in, uh, that's stroke and, and in epilepsy. <clears throat> Uh, so, I'll be speaking to you uh, on mechanical thrombectomy in stroke. Uh, until recently, the only treatment for acute ischemic stroke was intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, and uh, rapid delivery of uh, intravenous thrombolysis uh, uh, in stroke is absolutely crucial. However, with time, the number needed to treat increases or doubles. For, for example, uh, if you thrombolyze a patient within 90 minutes uh, and versus uh, uh, thrombolysis after three hours, uh, it rises from five to nine. Um, and thrombolysis uh, per se is not effective in certain types of patients. For example, patients with long uh, uh, thromb uh, clots or thrombosis, uh, as well as large vessel occlusions, which are very, very proximal. For example, if the, uh, there is occlusion of the internal carotid artery or the proximal segment of the middle cerebral artery, these patients, this cohort of patients, don't do as well with, uh, uh, with uh, acute thrombolysis. Uh, with the advent of uh, intraarterial clot retrieval uh, technology, uh, this practice now, there is, now there is a paradigm shift towards uh, mechanical thrombectomy in stroke. So what's the evidence? Uh, the initial trials were very di disappointing, but however, with, uh, with improvement in uh, one technology, two expertise that are uh, the, uh, trained people doing it, uh, the, the, the results have been much more um, uh, that there's been, there's been more efficacy, and and these trials, the the nine, the nine trials that have uh, that I'm showing to you today or depicted in this slide, uh, actually show an unequivocal uh, improvement in uh, uh, disability scores uh, at 90 days uh, in patients who've actually undergone both the combination of thrombolysis as well as uh, mechanical clot retrieval or mechanical thrombectomy. So uh, there's a recent meta-analysis of uh, randomized tri control trials. The proportion of patients achieving a good or independent functional outcome or MRS of 0 to 2 at 90, day, 90, 90 days was 46% uh, with the mechanical thrombectomy group versus 26.5% with the best medical treatment group. And most of the patients uh, in that particular meta-analysis received uh, intravenous thrombolysis uh, with mechanical thrombectomy. Who are the patients who benefit the most uh, with mechanical thrombectomy? Those are the patients with uh, the, sa the same cohort of patients that where uh, RTP or intravenous uh, thrombolysis is ineffective. Those are the patients with uh, in uh, internal carotid artery occlusion and proximal M1 segment uh, middle cerebral artery occlusion. Uh, as in uh, thromb uh, intravenous thrombolysis, the earlier you do the clot, clot retrieval, uh, the better. And also, if the aspect score is greater than five on your CT, uh, the chances of uh, outcome are much better. Complications, very little complications of mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, it's generally uh, divided into device-related uh, vessel injury, vascular uh, complications that are related to vascular access, as, as well as uh, uh, complications that are related to radiological contrast media, such as anaphylaxis and uh, AKI. So, uh, so in conclusion, mechanical thrombectomy uh, should be your first line in uh, uh, centers that are available, and it is available at NHSL. Okay, so next um, <clears throat> uh, segment that I'll be focusing is on epilepsy, uh, specifically epilepsy surgery. And uh, what do we mean by epilepsy surgery? The, or what's the main aim of epilepsy surgery is the identification of the cortical area capable of generating seizures and whose, re whose removal and disconnection will result in seizure freedom. Uh, so this slide, uh, most of the neurologists would be, uh, who are interested in Epilepsy would be um, uh, familiar with. This is the paper that was published in 2000 by Kwan and Brody. 
uh, and uh, the and this was the basis of uh, defining what uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy is. As you can see, uh, uh, when patient the, this cohort of patients when they they were treated with uh, a, a single anti-epileptic drug, uh, approximately forty-seven percent were seizure-free. Uh, you, uh, if you added a second monotherapy to these patients, a further 13% were seizure-free. And a, a third would uh, increase the uh, patients by, uh, or the, the seizure freedom, or patients with seizure freedom by about 4%. So as you can see, as you add on the anti-epileptic drugs, the number of patients that are, uh, that are seizure-free are uh, they, they reduce. Um, and that's the basis of pharmacoresistant uh, uh, epilepsy. So if a patient fails on at least two antiepileptic drugs, which are uh, at a reasonable dose and uh, well tolerated, the patient and, and they fail and the patient still experiences seizures, those patients are pharmacoresistant, uh, more patients who are called or named as pharmacoresistant uh, epilepsy or patients with uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. And these are the patients who, uh, who are suitable for epilepsy surgery. So what's the, what's the, uh, 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 the evidence? Uh, the first uh, trial that was published was in way back in 2001, uh, was a randomized control trial, again, uh, on, in a cohort of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, we found that uh, nearly 64% of uh, patients were seizure-free following epilepsy surgery versus a paltry 8% on best medical therapy. A co recent Cochrane review of 177 studies, in which included 16, 000, over 16,000 patients, which included four randomized control trials, again found that surgery was superior to anti-epileptic drugs uh, with a risk ratio of 7.67%, uh, sorry, 6, uh, 7.67. And uh, 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 again, the same reviews, uh, which included uh, 16,000, over 16,000 patients, had uh, over 10,000 patients, which is approximately 65%, achieving good outcome with regards to seizure control. Um, so population-based uh, uh, prospective studies all show long-term uh, seizure outcomes are very good. And what allows us uh, with epilepsy surgery is that these patients will be, uh, we, we might be able to reduce the anti-epileptic drugs as, or even stop these, uh, uh, the anti-epileptic drugs in these patients who are uh, seizure-free because they, uh, uh, if they're seizure-free for approximately five years, they're, they're more likely to be, remain seizure-free throughout. Okay, so who needs a uh, referral? These are the patients who are, again, pharmacoresistant. That means if the patient has failed on two anti-epileptic drugs or more, uh, and if the patient has more, more or less focal onset epilepsy with or without generalized seizures, and these are the patients who actually benefit the most. Um, and duration-wise, it's very variable. Traditionally, we took one to two years as a, as a benchmark, where if, if the patient fails after one to two years, then we refer these patients to, for epilepsy surgery. However, if the patient has catastrophic epilepsy, that is, if the seizures cannot be controlled, and they, are, and they are extremely debilitating, uh, or if the patient has status epilepticus, which we cannot treat uh, medically, these are the patients that might be referred for epilepsy surgery much, much earlier. Okay, so those are the two areas that I'll be fo uh, that I've focused on, and uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Kishara, for that informative lecture, and stick to your time. And uh, let me take the privilege to invite our next speaker, Dr. Manilka Sumanathilaka, consultant endocrinologist from National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Chintana. And uh, I wish to thank the College of Physicians for the kind invitation and for a moment uh, making me an executive chef to do dole out these small feeds. Let's see what I can dish out uh, from the endocrine menu. Okay, so this year has been a lot of uh, uh, research has come out. Probably people had uh, more time uh, 
doing up their writing. And so we see a flurry of a lot of landmark studies coming out in the literature. This is a common uh, thing, but I think it's very important to in our practice, which will give us more confidence to use metformin in pregnancy, the MITE study. Uh, you know, the MIG study and the MIG TOFU study gave us evidence that metformin is safe, and there is data up to about seven to nine years in the uh, offspring with the safety data. This study mainly looked at uh, starting metformin pretty early in the pregnancy compared to the other studies, six weeks onwards, and looked at the neonatal and the maternal outcome, uh, immediate postpartum. So they were on insulin. These were type two diabetic mothers who were on insulin before the pregnancy and uh, during early pregnancy, and they were given one gram BD of metformin and a placebo that were the two arms. And the primary endpoints are, as given here is shown, the pregnancy loss, preterm delivery, birth injury, and the other complications you see in the uh, neonates. What did it show? It showed, a, okay, first of all, the primary endpoints did not show a statistically significant difference. At least we know that it's very much safe, but of course it, it didn't show a, a statistically significant benefit either, but all these primary endpoints, it was uh, safe. Of course, the secondary endpoints, like the mean birth weight of the child was 210 grams less uh, compared to the placebo arm with a significant p-value, and there was decreased neonatal body fat mass. We know the epigenetic uh, programming and the future benefits of this fat mass being less and the future risk of metabolic uh, disorders and diabetes in the offspring. There are well-documented studies, so there's a benefit there for the child uh, in later in life. And the large babies, more than four kilograms, were significantly less in the metformin arm. So these are all very good benefits, although they were not the primary outcomes. And there are lots of benefits for the mother with good uh, glycemic control, lower maternal weight gain during the pregnancy, which has significant uh, implications, uh, benefits uh, later in her life, and less the number of cesarean sections. And of course, the insulin dose, as you can expect, was much lower in these patients. My previous colleague, so the next blockbuster drug in our uh, we can't say our now, we have to share it with our friends in nephrology and the uh, cardiologists now, it has gone out of the uh, diabetes world. The blockbuster drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which came as a cardiovascular protective diabetic medication, the studies were shown by the previous me speaker and made my job much easier. So I'm going to just uh, uh, mention a few uh, uh, things as well. So I think this was uh, done nicely by the previous speaker and the study was stopped early. So now the SGLT2 inhibitor showed a cardiovascular risk re reduction in diabetes. That was the Emparage outcome, the uh, CANVAS study, and the DECLARE, all those studies. So now they noticed that in these studies, the subgroup analysis showed that there was a marked improvement in heart failure there was marked improvement in the renal outcomes uh, going into end-stage renal failure and the reduction in GFR. So people looked at these entities separately. And now it's going beyond diabetics and they are looking at normal people with CKD and heart failure. So those are interesting times that we are having. I chose this because this was the latest, but the previous speaker did it uh, very nicely. So I'm going to skip that. and. All the composite endpoints show a statistically significant benefit, and they stopped the study early as well because of this thing. And the previous speaker also mentioned uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon where we see a, a, a drop in the EGFR when you start on these agents. So you have to be a bit brave and monitor your patients carefully. Eventually, in about six months to a year, they uh, improve. So that's the thing, but you have to monitor your patients carefully. Initially, there may be a drop in the GFR, but it eventually improves. That's what the studies show. In 36 months, you have a much bigger benefit, but you see the benefit only in about an year. So that is the key that you have to remember. 
sotaglifosine. So I think this may not have been discussed. This is a newer SGLT2 inhibitor, which has been tried in worsening heart failure in diabetics. This is a SGLT2 plus uh, SGLT1 inhibitor. As you know, the SGLT1 receptors are there even in the gut and it prevents the absorption of glucose. It works a bit like Acabose, our old drug, right? So this has a twin action and benefit in glycemic control plus in heart failure. This was very recently a published study where they showed that there is cardiovascular risk reduction in people who were admitted with heart failure, treated with IV diuretics, and who had a BNP level of more than 150 nanograms per ml. They showed a marked benefit and a uh, statistically significant uh, reduction. The number needed to treat uh, was uh, 76 versus 51 compared to the placebo. The mild side effects were the diarrhea and the hypoglycemia associated with the SGLT2 action, which uh, is understandable. So that, again, you can see the uh, results and look at the forest plot here. The more elderly and the people with a lower GFR uh, tend to show a better response compared to the others, but all across all the subgroups, this uh, benefit was shown in worsening heart failure with sotaglifosine. And there are, as the previous speaker uh, mentioned, the EMPERA studies and there are uh, DAPA-HF. All these studies show that there is benefit in heart failure, even in non-diabetic people. So it's our cardiology colleagues and the nephrology colleagues all sharing this wonderful medication. Going on to the uh, next uh, thing on uh, Cushing's disease, we have a new drug to medically treat Cushing's disease. As you know, surgery would be the number one option. Radiotherapy, if that fails, uh, octreotide and other treatment. Then we have paseriotide, which is more responsive than octreotide, the somatostatin 5 uh, uh, receptor blocker. Then these are very expensive medications. This is an oral medication. Com compared to ketoconazole and metarapon, this works better. We have mifepristone as well. So it's an 11-beta hydroxylase blocker, which is more efficacious than metarapone and less side effects compared to metarapone, including hirsutism and other side effects that you get. And this uh, summary slide shows that the vast majority of patients treated with this achieved at uh, urinary free cortisol level within the normal range or at least close to the normal range. So it's becoming a, a very good drug, oscillodotstat one to 30 milligrams, you have to start with a very low dose and up titrate, uh, a BD dosage up to 30 milligrams of uh, the drug BD. And this is uh, going to be a very uh, promising drug. Next uh, part I'm going to touch upon is the reversal of diabetes with lifestyle modification and weight reduction. This indeed needs small feeds as the picture shows. It's all about very low calorie diets regular exercise and uh, people have uh, attention was brought to this aspect by the direct study, which was published two years back, 850 calorie diet with a 15 kilogram weight loss in the overweight and the obese category, BMI more than 27. First five years of diabetes, people have reversed diabetes. In that study, 46% reversal up to one year was shown. Amazing because look at the impact on the complications. This study done in uh, Qatar, Diadem 1, showed they took people with uh, uh, first three years of diabetes and BMI more than 27, 61% achievement with 820 calorie uh, diet, nutritional supplement for the first three months and gradual introduction of a low calorie diet about 1,000 to 1,200 over the next one year and they showed that the reversal of diabetes was 61%. Might be tough to achieve in our scenario, but we should try. We might achieve even a lesser target compared to the placebo. Look at the numbers, how convincing the numbers is. So this is the, uh, the future reversal of type 2 diabetes with dietary modification. And of course, I'm going to finish with this uh, uh, slide. The long-acting insulins are in the news again. We know that People want more and more less injections, longer acting medications. We had Glargin 24 hours, Degludeg 36 to you know, uh, 40 hours. Now we have 
ICODEC, which is which has come out recently, once a week subcutaneous insulin. Wonderful. Because we have seen reversal of diabetes, even insulin helps. Initial insulin helps with reversal of type 2 diabetes. And this is an ideal drug for newly diagnosed diabetics. Once a week injection with your uh, lifestyle modifications and oral drugs, we can aim for reversal of diabetes. This has shown efficacy comparable to glargine. So the importance here is that everything is same as glargine, but seven versus one injection. So the acceptance and the acceptability for a newly diagnosed person, this will be much better. So we are hoping that we will get it very soon. And I'm going to finish my presentation with this semaglutide and NASH. So we are having once a week GLP receptor agonist, semaglutide, and the oral form will be a blockbuster cost permitting. The, we have got the oral semaglutide now, apart from the cardiovascular risk reduction, which has been shown with that also, the previous slide showed liraglutide. This also showed cardiovascular risk reduction in diabetics, but now this is showing a response uh, for NASH reduction in fatty liver and the fibrosis as well. So future, we might have some more medication for NASH. So ladies and gentlemen, giving the short speech, I have dished out few menus from our endocrine menu. If you can read up on all these uh, trials mentioned, I'm sure you can make it a academic feast in endocrinology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suman Kalika, for that interesting small feed. And I invite Chintana to present the token of appreciation. And that brings us to the end of the session on small feeds. Thank you. <laughs>